adults, we're going to start with the scapula. And the scapula is colloquially known as the shoulder blade. And I have here the left scapula. And you can see the posterior part of the scapula has this prominent feature here. And this is the scapular spine. And that immediately identifies it. it. Really is the posterior part of the scapula. The lateral part of the scapula is very obvious because you have this glenoid cavity here. And the glenoid cavity is where the head, oh, this is the wrong one, but anyway, so the head of the humerus is going to fit into this glenoid cavity here. So it has to be on the lateral aspect. And so the anterior part is really quite smooth. Now, if we look at just the general shape of this thing, we see it has some very nice borders that are delineated here. This would be the medial border of the scapula because it has to be on the opposite side of the glenoid cavity. Along this edge, we have the lateral border of the scapula. And here, at the top, we have the superior border. Then we have these sharp angles. We've got the superior angle. We have the inferior angle. And then we have this sharp angle where you have the glenoid cavity sort of can make this jag into the medial border, or sorry, the lateral border. Then we have this suprascapular notch here, and then we've got along the scapular spine, it will eventually come and curve forward into the acromion process, and the acromion process is anterior to the spine, and it goes anteriorly, that's what makes contact with the clavicle. And it makes this joint that you can feel right here called the acromioclavicular joint. You can feel it on yourself. And then, if you look slightly inferior and anterior to that, you can see the coracoid process coming off of here. And that's this part right here. Now, on either side of the scapular spine, superior and inferior, we have these depressions, and these are where muscles would be. Uh, muscles of the rotator cuff. So we've got the infraspinous fossa here, which is this little depression for the infraspinous muscle. And then we have the supraspinous fossa here, which is this little depression above the spine for the supraspinous muscle. I think that's all we need to know on the scapula. So then we can look over here at the humerus. Let's see if I can actually grab the correct humerus. Here we go. Yes, I did. Fortunately, I did. So here we have the humerus which is what articulates with the scapula. So the head of the humerus is a smooth part here. It's covered with hyaluronic cartilage. And it's smooth and it's going to articulate with that glenoid cavity. And then, obviously this is the medial part because it's what's going to articulate here. Then we have these two large protuberances that we call tubercles. One of which, the lateral most part, is the larger of the two. And it is called the greater tubercle. And then the one that is sort of anterior and medial to it is the lesser tubercle. And between them, you have the intertubercular groove. It also, if it helps you remember, it is also called the bicipital groove, the long head of the biceps uh, tendon. The tendon of the long head of the biceps muscle goes through it. So that kind of helps you remember that it's on the anterior surface. And then if we look here on the side here, you get this rough surface where the deltoid muscle attaches. This is your deltoid muscle, and it's going to attach to the deltoid tuberosity, which is this rough surface that sort of bows out at the proximal third, I'd say, of this bone. So now that we've done the proximal part, we can look to the distal end, and we can see the medial part, this big prominence on the medial part is on the same side as the head, and this is the medial epicondyle. And a condyle, an epicondyle, is anything outside of a condyle. This whole thing is a condyle and is an articular surface. This condyle happens to have two parts. This part, which is called the trochlea, because it looks like a pulley. And this part, called the capitulum. I just learned today that capitulum is supposed to be a uh, bald head. So it looks like a little bald head there. And you have the smaller outcropping of bone here. It's on the lateral part, and this is the lateral epicondyle because it's outside of the condyle. So you have the medial and lateral epicondyles. This whole thing is a condyle. It has both the trochlea, which is the medial part, and the
and the capitulum, which is the lateral part. The trochlea is going to be connected to the ulna here, and the capitulum is going to articulate with the radius here. So if we look at this part right here, this little depression, this is a fossa. This is the coronoid fossa, because as we will see, there's a part of the bone that articulates with this, the ulna, called the coronoid, coronoid process that fits right in there. We look on the back posterior face here, and we see there's a large fossa. And this is the olecranon fossa. You think about the olecranon being in the back of your elbow. You put up the whole arm here, although this is the other arm. And you can see that this ulna fits very nicely around the trochlea. And this is the olecranon process of the ulna. And it fits right there into the olecranon fossa. And then we see on the front part of this thing, the coronoid uh, process of the ulna fits right into that coronoid fossa. On this side, we have the radius, and we have the head of the radius, which looks like the head of a nail, that articulates with the capitulum. So if we then grab an ulna and a radius, here's a radius, here's an ulna, we can see this knot shape. And since it fits around the trochlea, it's called the trochlear notch. And it makes a C shape. As we said, the top part of the C is the olecranon process, the bottom part is the coronoid process. And then we look here, and we will see this um, indention. And this indention, although I have to admit this is the opposite arm, this indention is lateral, and it's a notch for the head of the radius, and so it's called the radial notch of the ulna. So then if we look distally, I think we've covered all the ulna that we need to, except for this part, if we look distally, is the styloid process. Now if we look at the radius, it's so-called because in the anatomic position, it will be straight and parallel with the ulna, but once you pronate your hand, the radius will go around the radius of the ulna like that. So right below the head of the radius, you have the radial tuberosity. And the bottom of the radius is really quite wide, unlike the ulna, which becomes narrow, narrower and tapered. You also have a styloid process on the radius. And you will see that the, take one that's still actually attached to the skeleton, you will see that the ulna is most medial and the radius is the lateral part. So the styloid process of the radius is on the lateral side and the styloid process of the ulna is on the medial side. And then we have one more thing we need to know right here at the very bottom where the radius and the ulna articulate at the distal end. We have a little notch at the distal end of the radius called the ulnar notch because, and I think this is the wrong one actually, I don't think we have the right pair here, but yeah, that does work. Okay, so this notch is for the ulna at the distal end, hence it's the ulnar notch of the radius, and this notch in the ulna for the head of the radius at the proximal end is called the radial notch. That's it. Probably about the longest video.